It's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce the former head chef of Open Farm Community in Singapore, but amongst many other things, a uh, real force of nature. Oliver Truesdale, please come on stage, my friend. All right, wicked. Uh, what's, how's this thing work? I pointed at you? Okay, cool, cool. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Break okay? Energy levels up? We're surviving? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did want to just start out with a quick round of applause, or not a round of applause, a quick round of thanks for everybody who uh, organized Kita here. Um, I haven't been to KL for 15 years, so it was also a really fun reintroduction to the city. So thank you very much for having us, uh, Lisa and Darren. And thank you to all the other speakers today as well. Um, a lot of really cool insight and a lot of things that are sort of uh, maybe a bit more than tangential to what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I guess I can go back and you can read that. Well, whatever. Fuck it. Um, to introduce myself, to those of you who don't know me, I'm all the stuff that Ivan just said and not much else. Um, I left kitchens around a year ago, and it's not a permanent departure, but it's been a departure that's given me a lot to a lot of time to think, and a lot of um, interesting views on the food industry have sort of cropped up. Um, I've worked basically the most nomadic chef life you could um, ask for. So I started in Canada where I'm from and I did my training and apprenticeship there, but quickly I was in the States and then I was in Australia. And after Australia, my partner Phoebe and myself started a pop-up restaurant um, company where we were kind of all over the world, uh, Japan, Denmark, Sri Lanka, um, always intimately involved with farms and uh, locavore sort of uh, oriented pop-ups. And it's given me a lot of insight into the industry as a whole and a lot of insight into the um, cross-section of, of agriculture and, and restaurants, which I'm particularly concerned about. So my new project is based on that. What we're trying to do is figure out a, a path forward for regenerative hospitality. Um, in the last five years, I've been in, in Singapore running Open Farm Community, which is the only downtown uh, in-soil farm in Singapore. Uh, that's been a great experience, but we thought it was time to branch out on our own and figure out what we're going to do um, ourselves without having the oversight of a, of a corporate overlord, so to speak. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on some topics. And just so you're all aware, this is just going to kind of move around. And it's not going to have anything to do with my talk. It's just wallpaper. But I thought it's nicer than looking at me for 20 minutes. So, um, <laughs> so something, so, look at that. It's fucking gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I wanted to start by talking about uh, conflict, actually. And given our current political climate, I sort of wrote this and then I was like, oh, it's a bit on, on the nose as there's a real conflicts going on, a real people suffering in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to relate some idea of conflict to the industry in that I feel like our industry is at a crossroads and that in many of our kitchens, we're um, at war with ourselves, our staff, our supply chains, um, even sometimes our clientele. Um, and in the farms which we rely upon as an industry, we're at war with nature itself, and we are sort of engaging in chemical warfare on a massive scale on soil, on plants, and on the food we put in our mouth, on insects, on pollinators. Um, and in the broader world, we're at war with a changing climate, we're at war with ideologies, and we're at war with each other. And so with this in mind, how does hospitality fit into finding the balance and finding this sort of elusive notion of peace? Um, I have a passion for, for minimalism, and I try and be quite reductive in, in the way I think about things. So I want to I distill things down and figure out how to eliminate complexity from situations and find a sort of soul so that we can relate to things on a deeper level than simply um, you know, addressing symptoms, let's say. So I wanted to talk about some common complaints in the industry, and some of them have come up today, which has been great, actually. So there's some like, you know, rationale to connect this to some other talks. I mean, a big one that we saw in the other talks was uh, people talking about staffing and, and the young generation being too soft, um, which, yeah, fair enough, whatever. But, um, or that young chefs don't have dedication and initiative, or young chefs don't have any idea what they're doing. And the big one is like young chefs won't work in the same uh, way and conditions that we used to. And I think that's both a fair and accurate description of, of 
what's happening, but I think there's an unnecessarily negative connotation to that kind of speech in that because as business owners or people who run businesses, they won't work in the same sort of slave-like conditions that many of us uh, toiled under. Uh, there's there's this negativity around that. And I think we need to be really honest and, and look at our industry and go, yeah, chefs probably shouldn't work the way we used to work. People like human bodies shouldn't work the way we used to work. Um, chefs should sleep more and have a better work-life balance. And you know the potential for interests outside of the industry would be great. Um, and I think that in, in some ways, instead of looking at this propensity of young chefs nowadays to uh, you know, clock watch a little bit or, or not want to have abuse hurled at them or physical objects hurled at them. Um, we miss an opportunity in which we can be the generation that sort of bridges a gap between an industry that has some classically like abusive tendencies and an industry that might be a really nice place to work for impassioned individuals. Um, I don't think that people should come in having to earn uh, a place in the same way that we had, or that I had to earn my place in, in kitchens, and uh, which was often even like to the limit of physical violence. Um, I think that people should be listened to and paid attention to on the merit of them being a person who wants to work with you, rather than having to prove themselves. Um, this obviously has various shades of gray, and we were speaking earlier about this difficulty in identifying what will work for what person because we have chefs coming into kitchens who are that soft person who wants to be babied who needs to be handheld um, can sometimes do remarkable things with that treatment um, and then there are chefs coming into our kitchens who are just like i want to be a machine i will work till i die i will sleep on the potato sack in the back let's do this kind of thing and uh it's about trying to figure out how we look at people as individuals rather than uh having a blanket one size fits all management strategy um, my father was also a chef and I've seen from basically from his era to mine what was tolerated. Um, so I know the stories of, of when he was coming up in what were largely closed kitchens and where abuse might be sort of commonplace today in, in some high pressure kitchens. Back then there was often like a concept of abuse for fun, uh, which has sort of fallen out of favor, uh, in the vast majority of kitchens, thankfully. Um, and those cycles still affect us today. But the other aspect of that uh, war in kitchens is that many of us have developed a self-destructive drive based on that. Uh, so like we've internalized things. You know, I started at, at 15 years old in kitchens. Uh, I'm 35 years old and my entire body structure is like at least 10 years my senior. Um, I have spinal problems. I have problems with my knees. And that's not softness, that's, that's being destroyed over a long career and that's to say nothing of the mental strain of sort of long hours there's a lot of rampant alcoholism there's crazy financial pressure and a high stress load that exerts itself on many chefs um, I think we as an industry can talk about solving this as opposed to acting like it's a negative thing that the next uh, generation won't stand for this kind of behavior um, to impose these conditions on the next generation I think is, is kind of should be seen as a failure um, and to borrow a proverb for how I think about this is like uh, the same water that, that softens a carrot hardens an egg, right? So if you have a boiling pressure cooker, every individual is going to react to that differently. Um, and what we need to be able to do is when someone asks you like, look, I want to be dunked in boiling water all the time. You need to be able to do that for them. But when somebody asks you like, if you dunk me in boiling water all the time, I'm going to just like leave the kitchen today you need to be able to create an environment where they're uh, appropriately fed in their passion. Um, so to figure out how we do that, I think we need to look at some of the cores of our industry um, because we have, as an industry, we've, there's been a really rapid evolution um, over the course of my life and an even more rapid evolution over the past 10 years. Um, in many ways, I think we need to do in our kitchens what or sorry, we need to do in our industry what we do in our kitchens, which is that you need to find a space and leave it better than you found it. That should be the goal for almost every industry. And I think that in restaurants, we sort of have this idea that we're going to find a space and make it what we want it. But that's not leading forward our industry in any progressive uh, fashion. I also want to be clear that most of the conditions I endured I, were things I volunteered for. So I'm not... It's, it's not, uh, it wasn't a coercive thing for me. I, I was not aiming for balance. I was, I, ha I still have a tradition of, of, of sort of pushing things to the maximum. 
and uh, trying to live with the results at the end. But we end up in a state as an industry where we're navigating something similar to what many cultures and ideologies have done since time immemorial, which is balancing tradition and modernization. There have been talks about this today in relation to Malay cuisine. Let me get another picture. There we go. Okay, that one we've seen. Okay, rice test. Sweet. Um, in relation to Malay cuisine, but as, a, as an industry, we have a, yeah, a rapid evolution and many things are, are changing at such a clip that it's, it's hard to react to them appropriately. Um, so the tables of all of our nations are changing shape. We're losing like biodiversity is disappearing from the plates of our world. In fact, even plates are disappearing from the tables of our world. Uh, there's these crazy stats like 20% of, yeah, of meals in America are eaten in cars. It's fucking mental. So like we're talking about an industry that's supposed to adapt to eating patterns that are in a, a constant state of evolution. Delivery meals are through the roof. Uh, and so while we change to, to suit the industry and suit the supply and demand um, dynamic of our industry, it's important we don't forget the core values of our industry along the way. In the context of hospitality, we need to find a way to move forward in the modern era while keeping our finest traditions. Um, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm, I'm personally pretty comfortable with, but as a hospitality industry, I think largely could be left behind without anybody feeling too plaintive about it. And this goes beyond abuse. I think this sort of like hermetic environments with halogen lights uh, locked behind closed doors with little circular windows for you to look at the guest are, are fine to keep going. The sort of pompous pageantry of really like monarchical tradition, fine dining uh, maybe is, is a heritage element, but there's not a lot of reason that it should persist into the modern era. Um, but alongside those things, there's, there's plenty to keep in our industry. The, the, as they say, like the, the roots of our industry are very strong and they're primal. And I think that they are not uh, brought to the fore enough. And especially in the modern context, I think that the current generation, the, the soft ones, um, are not getting educated in the core principles of our industry in the same way that maybe we, we did even if the education took place in a sort of polluted framework. Um, so what we have right now is a generation and many of them are incumbent in taking over kitchens uh, who are unfamiliar with a notion of principled hospitality uh, and cooking. And uh, in the same way that sort of my generation is a bit too far removed from a second world war to understand the lead up and social dynamics that uh, led to it without you know, education in that field, uh, we have a generation of cooks right now who are a little bit underprepared to carry forward the most important traditions of our industry. There's obviously um, many, many exceptions to this rule, but I think the trajectory as an industry is quite plain to see if you look at it from an industry-wide perspective. Um, at this point, it's probably... What was the thing? Laser points. Okay. Uh, it's probably essential to define what I mean when I speak about hospitality. Um, actually, I don't really have to do that because the former speaker just did a fucking awesome job at hospitality. But my interpretation of hospitality is that it's exemplified in a treatment of guests that supersedes transactional uh, nature. So um, not so much the prostitution aspect of the service industry, but when a host and guest co-mingle in crafting an experience that is better than the transactional uh, nature of that experience. And I draw a pretty firm distinction between hospitality and the restaurant business. So though they're essential to one another, uh, the restaurant business is, let's say, it's more in the context of upselling and average checks and, and uh, its success is measured in the bottom line on a P&L sheet. And hospitality is more relevant to the type of venture which, uh, in which success is relationships, it's creativity, it's craftsmanship, uh, it's authenticity. And success is measured in the health of those relationships. So I think that further than that, relationships among staff and relationships with the artisans, with farmers, uh, and even in a wider context, relationships with the natural world um, or the social environment around you, your community, are important pieces of hospitality and they, they may not be as important pieces of the restaurant business, although I do feel there's obviously massive overlap in, in, in both of them. I also wanted to touch on the fact that there's sort of a pernicious imitation of, of genuine hospitality to, that is quite common today, which is centered around the ego. Um, there's a lot of people doing hospitality, not for the core value hospitality propositional reasons, but for fame, for success, for their own personal validation. 
Um, I feel like standing on stage and saying that's a bit hypocritical in, <laughs> in some ways, but also I do feel like it does intervene with true hospitality in that some of the relationships in that context will ultimately reveal that it's not true hospitality. So there will be failures of um, that sort of imitation of hospitality to really show itself as authentic. Um, and I just wanted to like to give a guiding sort of few principles for hospitality. I think we're talking about two core things, uh, at least today. There's, there's many guiding pieces of hospitality, but two core things that I wanted to touch on today that I feel like are very relevant in a cross-cultural framework, in a global framework, and they have such a wide-reaching implication that, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're very important for me, let's say. Uh, and one is the transfer of energy. So there's the concept of transferring energy. And the second is empathy and caring. And uh, we were lucky enough that we got the root words of gastronomy uh, dealt with in the former talk, but the root words of hospitality also belie sort of these principles. Hospitality is based on the same word that hospitals, hospices, and hostels are, uh, places where, in which you're hosted, in which you're cared for. And it can also be used in the inverse. People who are hostile to you are trying to do the opposite of hospitality to you. Um, this relationship between host and guest is governed by principles that uh, are like very, very ancient in, in the human species and in some ways supersede any legal framework or, or natural relationship that you will sort of develop in society. The, the act of being fed by someone and feeding someone or taking care of someone is about as intimate an act as you can, can get. Um, every ra major religion has parables for hospitality. Uh, cultures as well, like Greeks, have a concept of xenia, and the Japanese have a motenashi. And the principles are so tied up in, in sort of cultural and sacred significance that in northern India, the phrase, the guest is God, is like the guiding principle of hospitality. And that's also because even the Greeks have this where apparently the gods used to come and make sure you were being hospitable, and if not, they would fuck your shit up. So um, they it's so important that the divine looks upon it as, as an important pillar of human society. Um, and the root word of restaurants is equally informative. So literally means a place to go get restored, right? It's a, a place that is restorative or that serves restoratives, a place to go when you're in need of food, of sleep, of care, warmth, conversation, compassion. Um, and the beautiful aspect of these expressions of hospitality is that they're as diverse as sort of the host and the guest uh, themselves. So, you have an expression of hospitality. All of us sort of work in the industry, or many of us work in the industry, and the hospitality for each guest is slightly different just due to the nature of the guest. Um, if you understand and internalize that the core value of propo value proposition of restaurants is not just to fuel people, so like let's take fast food out of the equation for hospitality, and not to present pure perceived value, which is fine dining's sort of proposition, you're left with an understanding that the core of, of hospitality is a transfer of energy. So from the inedible to the edible, or from the repulsive to the delicious, from the difficult to digest to the easily absorbed, cooking and feeding people is a transfer of energy between host and guest. You spend your energy and the energy of nature itself to create something that guests both enjoy and find restorative. Empathy helps you understand the needs of your guest and helps you create the conditions for their comfort. So people who are good at empathy can sometimes predict needs that you were unaware that you had. This is, for me, this is the prototype of, of amazing service, is when I receive something and I go, fuck, I didn't know I needed that, but now that I have it, I love it. This is amazing. Um, empathic service can take a form that's even more predictive, uh, which is sort of what I'm trying to focus on, is that you're removing obstructions from your guests' well-being before they're even in your care. So this can take the form of curation of products and comes in a format that can even sort of supersede the necessity of individual pleasure in a hospitality experience. So things like, is this food healthy for my guests? Uh, does this food compromise my guests' integrity? Um, this is where empathy sort of transitions into care because service providing is by definition, somebody asks you for something and you give them something and they'll probably uh, pay you in return. But when empathy trans in, transforms into care is when you're going to begin to act on your guest's behalf in an understanding of what's good for them. Much like um, a parent might let you get hurt or, or maybe that's a bad example, but 
might let you get hurt in order to learn from the experience. Um, you, you will sometimes be in a position as a chef in which you will remove agency from your guests in order for them to, to flourish and be in health. So you choose where the food your guest is coming from. Uh, sorry, you choose, <laughs> you choose the food your guests are going to eat um, and where it's coming from. And I think that because of that, you're sort of a defender of their integrity from a health perspective, but also from an ethics perspective. If we are what we eat, the person who feeds you is in an enormous position of power. Uh, food service is unique because people literally internalize what you're going to give them. So they, they, they consume like into their bodies what you give them. Um, this is a space where it's really important to care for the individuals and also the sources of things we feed them. So there's like this uh, relationship which we were just, the former speaker was just talking about between sort of um, the natural environment and the guest where chefs sit at a, a sort of inflection point, let's say. Yeah. Um, on another level, and especially relevant in sort of mega cities like Kuala Lumpur or Singapore or others, you're dealing with a clientele base that in many ways are cut off from nature. Um, you're the linkage to the natural environment. For a lot of people, their only interactions with the organic now in a modern society are when they interact with other people or when they interact with food. So does the food you're making damage the environment that the people you're caring for rely upon? Uh, is it sustainable environmentally, socially, financially for you to feed people uh, in the way that you're going to feed them? And I think here we can we can kind of come to another part of the war, which is the the farm wars that we're we're all sort of tacitly participating in, and that farms that produce food in a warlike manner don't factor into a caring environment, in my opinion. Um, as chefs, we can transform slaughter into sustenance, but we cannot make healthy food from toxic products. And we can't inverse the damage done to nature by using products that cause that damage in the first place. Uh, not to get too into food as a sacred thing, but in the same way that many religious texts say, treat others how you'd like to be treated, I think we need to feed others how we'd like to be fed. Uh, we can take these principles like one step further. And if you're caring for an individual, you end up caring for a mass of individuals. When you push comes to shove, you're caring for a community, a society, an environment, and soon, if you look hard enough and squint a little bit, you're caring for the whole fucking world. And in general, I think this is a really good thing. And I think this is a, a concept that chefs need to embrace, that we're not simply caring for a single guest. We're caring for everybody in the room, and we're caring for everybody in the community, and we're caring for everybody in the environment. So with that, I just want to say that it'd be great to sit down in peace once in a while and share some tasty food. Cheers. Thank you, that was great. Uh, I have a quick question before yeah, this. But I, I like this notion of what you nourish nourishes you bit. It's part of our thing at Nuri. I mean, we use it as a, tag, yeah. a, a tagline <laughs> that. for that. And so it speaks to my heart. And it feels, uh, when we were having this conversation just a second ago, that the industry kind of veered into turning the act of dining primarily into an entertainment act. Mm. And that ends up being a large pool for chefs. Emerging talent um, recognizes the potential value of that, and obviously that could turn a business sustainable overnight, right? But in that process, it seems that we lose a little bit. And you touched on that part, the responsibility that chefs have as far as cooks that make things that end up in people. Mm. But I'd like you to expand on that a little bit more because it's a brilliant point and it never gets said enough. In terms of just like it's our, important our role, yeah, uh, so yeah, um, yeah. Well, I like I do think that we we have a very unique role in society, and that uh, there's no other outside of medicinal industries, which you can sort of make a, a quite close allegory with, like you know, Hippocrates being food is medicine and medicine your food or whatever. But like outside of medicinal industries, there's no other industry in which the people creating things are. Uh, the things that we create are put directly into people's bodies. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to have a bit more responsibility than say, like, look, fashion is a, is a wildly polluting industry. It's a really bad, like fast fashion is a really bad industry. I don't think that's as primal. I don't think that's as, n like, it doesn't necessitate change as much as food because food is so much more um, out of it. Like, it's so much more important as a, as a cultural and social norm. Um, that if we do it irresponsibly, we sort of normalize uh, a very irresponsible part of our culture. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. And before I, I dig, we have a little bit of time, right? Lisa Tyler. <laughs> She's like, you never have time. Okay. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> let me just go straight into it then. Uh, are there restaurants, groups of people that you know of that are exemplary in their hospitality? What do they do well? Yeah, I think, well, this is part of why, like, uh, in, in Singapore, we have a, like an F&B Sustainability Council, and, and largely this is because we uh, we saw that there, there are people, there's, there's obviously people doing exemplary stuff. There's many people in this room doing exemplary stuff in, in the hospitality industry. Um, but I do think that most chefs... Most, maybe chefs are not even the, the necessary piece of that, but most restaurants that do something well um, silo, like they, they focus in on that. Uh, that's a good word to make a yeah, transition to silo. Um, but many people do one thing very well, and especially with, with regards to sustainability, like everybody has a focus area. Everybody has something that they see, uh, even like you're seeing food waste and you're, and you're very focused on food waste. And that's, that's awesome, but there's not very many operations that do everything really well. Um, so those are fairly fa fairly rare in the world. Um, I, I guess it does behoove, like Silo in London is, is an amazing example of a restaurant. I don't actually know anything about their social sustainability. I don't know anything about their financial sustainability, but I think they have a, an ethos that is very close to the, the core guiding principles of hospitality. Um, and they have internalized a, a an ethic that's going to lead them in the right direction no matter what problems they face, mm. which I think is what I was trying to get at with this talk is that we as an industry is kind of need to figure out what ethical pillars we're going to sit upon in order to, in order for young people who are following to be able to look at a problem and go, okay, like I need to view this through the lens of like, how is this environmentally uh, responsible? How is this socially responsible? How is this financially responsible? Um, but I don't think we're doing enough of educating people about the core values of our industry that are coming up after us. Yeah, great. I think the, the last two questions can be kind of merged into one because they're in some way related and also touch upon this thing of the human to human transference you were talking about earlier. Um, the question at the bottom says, doesn't the market determine which direction things are going to? And we're seeing like an incredible push for tech uh, obviously, lower costs, the problem of labor shortage, and now AI. So you have a mechanistic, automated, super intelligent computer uh, solutions there that perhaps creates also a, a problem. Where do you sit in all this, having worked in tech also in some ways? Yeah, uh, I mean, I've done uh, food at sort of both ends of the spectrum in terms of sustainability, right? We've done a lot of, like, I, I launched the most sustainable protein in the world, um, earlier this year uh, and I've also been working with sort of agroforestry initiatives um, for a large chunk of my career and uh, it's my opinion I, I talked about this a little bit more in Singapore but it's my opinion that the answers for most of the problems in the world are not new um, I do think sort of the framework in which we live which is you know capitalism in a nutshell I'm not anti-capitalist by any measure but I do think that it it will create solutions to, to problems that we already have answers for, and those solutions will be uh, sort of investment framework solutions. Um, I don't think that there's gonna be a VC funded uh, technology that's gonna silver bullet the environmental degradation that we're causing as an industry. I think it's up to chefs to decide to work with good farms that are promoting soil health, uh, doing responsible agroforestry, uh, doing syntropic farming. Um, that's gonna be the fix. It's never going to be, uh, you know, the AI spouted like a six letter or a six word sentence that's going to solve everything for us. Uh, we already know the answers to most of our problems. They're just not, uh, what do you want to call it? Like capitalistically convenient uh, in that you can't constant, you can't seek never ending growth in, in certain answers to the fundamental problems that we face as a planet. Um, yeah. Does that answer that? I think so. I think so. Well, and that kind of answers does the market determine which um, can we trust it? Yeah, yeah. I, like to a degree, I actually think like free market forces. There's a there's a point at which they become redundant, but mostly in terms of just uh, producing valuable goods and and competitive uh, answers to things, the free market is much better than sort of centralized planning, which is tends to be the two options that are put forward. So um, that being said, I think that you know we are seeing 
governments get eclipsed by companies now and uh, that becomes a bit more dangerous because in the last talk there was a, there was a mention of um, if the, it, what was it, the supplier demand thing and it's like there is such a thing as manufactured demand, uh, demand. yeah there's yeah. like a very, this is like a very real thing that, that companies can invest enough money to create an industry for themselves to service. Like this, corn in the United sure, States. Like, sure, like like all of the big food Soy. companies, yeah, it's, 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 um, and those receive heavy subsidies and lobbying money that's like absolutely astronomical. So no, you can't trust the market, but I do think that we can determine, as an industry, we have a huge piece of determining in which direction the market goes. Um, so hearing things like that Bua Kulim, yeah, Bua Kulim, is like really hard to get now, is both sort of heartening and sad at the same time, because you go, well, if we're creating um, uh, an avenue for revenue for indigenous communities in, in Malaysia, especially like Orang Asli are a heavily marginalized community, um, then we're doing something positive, right? But if we're creating such a demand that we're driving a species to extinction, maybe we need to look at a balance. Um, and that's where the market gets a bit dicey, is the market doesn't naturally check itself before it totally wrecks something. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You, Oliver.